We now have the cavers, and I'm going to call on Jim Ayres, author of an outstanding book about caving adventures, to speak about his caving experiences with Peter. Well, Eddie, Pete soon made his mark in the caving world, and I came with him a, a quite a bit, and I realised very soon he was different from the rest of us. He didn't train in pubs. I mean, and he had bright ideas. I mean, who in the 60s would have dreamed of the idea of scrounging a lift on a banana boat to Jamaica and spending a year exploring miles of virgin river caves and get paid for it? Well, that was Pete. And who else but Pete Livesey would go to Greece with a bandit who was carrying a shotgun, a jelly knight, and volunteer to be lowered down a 1,300-foot chasm on a winch. This is in Pete's words. Built by a crazy Irish mechanic who could improvise a winch from three empty tins of SAS spam, a bayonet and a donkey. <laughs> and with a, an Irish radio transmitter that only worked in daylight. <laughs> Uh, that was Pete, but by a, by a master stroke of timing, the witch operators stopped at the right time, and Pete unfastened his harness and hung, hung it and his rucksack on the seat and went for the, to explore the cave, only to be stopped down by the sight of the winch seat sailing up into the great outdoors without him. So he used his skills as a runner and steeplechaser. Pete caught the seat and hung on with his hands. Again, in Pete's words, at about 15 feet, I began to ponder the wisdom of this course of action. <laughs> <laughs> and by 17 foot 6 inches, I had to let go. So there was Pete, surrounded by the wreckage of his gear, as his rucksack snagged and tore open on its unaccompanied journey up the shaft, with bits of transmitter, jumars and carabiners crashing round him. Again, in Pete's own words, a pinch seat from the crank, uh, is it 21 or 19? My fingers encountered a smashed microphone with no lead. Lucy, calling Wallam of Ubala Base. Lucy, calling Wallam of Ubala Base. Come in, please. Silence. Not even the chirping of dead chuffs. Silence. <laughs> so here I was, 2,000 miles from home sitting on a rock 1,300 feet underground in a dark, icy cathedral, staring up at a pinpoint of light that was the surface of a mountain somewhere in the military zone of the Albanian border. As I sat there on my rock, pondering which plan the loonies up above were about to adopt, a great avalanche came rumbling down the shaft. There, 700 feet above, was Sean, the Irish mechanic, leaping about on a 50-degree ice field, stuck to the side of the shaft, having just cleared it of snow to make a ledge for himself. Like the rest, Sean was crazy, but he descended for a souvenir, an arm or a leg or something, and I was eventually rescued. Pete Livesey was obviously a man before his time. I mean, who else would have dreamed up the idea of using nubile female students as Sherpas? After all, he explained to me, women, pound for pound, are fairly strong. Well, they don't weigh much, and they don't eat much, and they don't smell as bad as men. <laughs> so they should be ideal on an expedition. Accordingly, Pete drew up an impressive brochure for his next Greek expedition to Epos in the Pindus Mountains. He visited the magic land of Greece, very cheap holiday, Subsidised travel, see the glorious Aegean, see the ruins, pleasant walking tours and beaches. And he stuck this up on the notice board at Bingley. He omitted to mention that the uh, luxurious coach was two transit vans, which had been modified for carrying bread. And it, they consisted of two large alloy boxes, which were bolted on the chassis, and at the back was a roll-up blind. Nothing else. And we, we, we got into one of these things. Oh, it, it stuck some Union Jacks on the side to make it look good. And we got inside this thing and started off, lifted the roller blinds up so we could see out. And we found, every time we went uphill, somebody fell out the back. And we couldn't stop the drive because we got no communication. 
So, so we, we banged on the size of the tin box till somebody stopped. And then we drove to a joiner's shop and got lots of pieces of wood, which we fit across the back as slats. So we could pull the roller blind down halfway and leave the slats there to stop us sliding out on the hills. The other problem was when we did that, the exhaust fumes sucked in. So we stopped again. Thanks to Pete's ingenuity, we opened some tins of beans and ate them and put the bean tins on the exhaust. We took the exhaust fumes away. This, uh, this, little, uh, this little arrangement with these two vans, we were galloping across Europe with, with this character here swinging off the back of one in a harness making a film which we'd never seen. <laughs> <laughs> Some, some of the young ladies, of course, weren't, yeah, they weren't too happy with this arrangement. I mean, after what Peter told them, you know, and they're bouncing about in the back of these vans and they're really browned off. And when it, they got to where we were going, of course, they, they uh, found out that the pleasant walking tour involved lugging heavy rucksacks full of caving gear up a mountain. And after some hard caving down the shafts of Epos, the only great ruins to be seen were us as we had been existing on Kerry. Life was grim, until we discovered Pete's secret hoard of lemonade powder and chocolate bars, which were hidden away in his tent. For the, for the underground camps, Pete said. I'd forgotten about them. The magic of Greece soon began to fade when we were bombarded by thunderbolts, washed out by a torrential rain and attacked by wild dogs one of which nearly did a bobbit on Tom Wigley, a wild Australian who chased after a large, ferocious beast when he ran off with Simparoo in his mouth. The fact that Tom was naked didn't deter him. And as he hit a dog with a boot, it dropped Sid and ran off. The trouble with Australians, they don't know when to stop. And Tom galloped after the dog, threw his other boot and missed. Have you ever seen a dog smile? This dog stopped, gave a crafty leer over its shoulder, and then turned and gave chase after Tom, who was clutching his willy, and he ran like a pink panther on speed, completely naked, with his dog after him. Our young Sherpas were anxious to see a beach, but we, unfortunately, which were typical of these expeditions, we'd run out of money. Along came Mr. Livesey. He suggested we sell our blood in Thessalonica at three pound a, three pound a pint, he said, if we get for it. So, <coughs> have you ever tried selling your body to a complete stranger? <laughs> Especially when they don't speak English. Anyway, the, the system was, we stood outside the hospital until some distraught Greek comes flying out then they'll pinch you to see if you are full. They'll take you inside. We, we, have a, we had a, a member who was fairly expendable, so we thought we'd try it on him. Jim Farnworth. It's called him Oxfam because he was always hungry. And broke. So we pushed Jim forward, and this old lady came, came out, grabbed him, took him inside, and emerged later looking very pale and translucent but smiling and clutching a fistful of money. We escorted him to the nearest bar to see if he filled up again <laughs> before the rest of us tried it out. It was a success. And soon we were all flogging our blood. One block was so rare we had him emptied. <laughs> and then Pete, our gallant leader, went in and came out shortly afterwards in a complete rage. Peter Livesey. Superman had been rejected. <laughs> he says, bloody Greeks, he said. Must be too bloody strong for them. <laughs> well, you can say that again. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. I'm now going to ask Dave Cobley to say a few words. Thanks, Dave. I was asked to do a slideshow at the YHA in Huddersfield. 
And uh, when I did the slideshow and talk, got it finished, we just had the normal questions and answers at the end of it. And the tall lad with a um, round smiling face with enormous rimmed glasses came walking up and asked what it would be like to start climbing. Would it be, who do I go with? What equipment do I need? So we talked for some time. And uh, eventually he was introduced and enthusiastically entered into the Phoenix Climbing Club activities. But more to the point, from my point of view, what he did, he actually got me caving. And really and truthfully, it's probably one of the best moments of my life because we had some fantastic times. We went one weekend to the Bradford Pothole Club because that's where he was a member of. And the idea was to do a trip, but this trip somehow started in the evening. It was a night trip. And it was down Dickon Pot, which sort of connects with Alan. Now, it was only just an ordinary trip, really, uh, but um, it was probably my second trip. We had to do it at night time. And it was only in later years, as it occurred to me, really, as the only reason we did it at night time was the fact that he didn't want to pay a farmer for walking across the field. <laughs> we got to the cave, and in typical Livesey fashion, decided that we ought to go and have a look. And the reason it was difficult was the fact there was a lot of water going down it. And it's not really a nice place to be when there's a lot of water going down. We worked our way to the top of the pitch and the water was thundering over. And we got it rigged up and Pete went down and we all went down. We got to the chamber at the bottom of the big pitch and it was like a big maelstrom. There was a tremendous wind blowing. There was a lot of water and spray around. An awful lot of noise as well. And we got to the bottom, we walked on to the next continuation into the alum itself with all the tackle. And we had a look and a good scout round and decided that we really is too much water to get down the next pitch. So we had to make the way out. Um, communications weren't all that good when there's all that much water going down that chamber. Pete went up first, top rope up first, threw the rope down. It's quite difficult getting the rope down. Eventually the other two members got out and I was left at the bottom last. That seemed to be my sort of position on a lot of these trips in that situation. I was always sort of last. The road was coming down, and I always remember it snaking down. Communication was terrible. And about halfway down this sort of underfoot pitch, the rope actually went through the rung of the ladder. And uh, it carried on coming down. So after a very long time trying to communicate, Eventually the rope went up and came down in the proper way and we got out. I think in some respects I'd sort of passed a little test, so to speak. He had this idea that uh, the MPC were looking to find or extend a cave called Echo Pot. Now Echo Pot is situated on Fountains Fell, which for the people that don't know in the Dales... It's a fell which is to the east of the road, which is to the east of Penigent. And it was a very small, grotty sort of thing, about sort of 15 inches wide and about 10 or 12, 15 inches high, and half full of water. It has subsequently been extended and gone quite deep. But the thing was, the NPC were doing some work down there. And right at the end of this small passage, they were trying to enlarge it to make it bigger so they could actually get on a little bit further. But during the process of doing that, all the little pieces of stones and all the debris that they'd been working with had fallen into the crack at the end. And with the water going in, the passage had actually sumped up. So what they'd done was they'd decided to get a pump. And it was a small hand pump, submersible, uh, which they took into the cave, assembled it, and they could put that in the water, turn this, pull this handle backs and forwards, and the delivery hose then 
put the water into sort of a makeshift dam. They tried to do this and they couldn't actually lower the water far enough to get enough air space to get onto the end of the passage. So in effect they'd actually abandoned it. As far as people were concerned, at the end of the, this particular week, it was the MPC dinner. And what he wanted to do was to clear this passage and get the pump out and present it to the dinner with all the comments it made. But he decided that there wasn't a lot of time to do it. So the best thing was to have a midweek trip. So we set off from Muddersfield around about 6 o'clock at night, drove to Fountains Fell, and parked the car on this end of this track, which is really forbidden land, up the track, over the wall, down the cave, no ladders. As you go down the passage, it narrows down to something quite small, but you've got minimal airspace as you're going through it. So you've got your head on one side, and you've got the sort of the water coming level with your chin. And as you're squeezing through and round the bend, you come into another small chamber. When we got into the chamber, we could see that the passage that the NPC were working on was virtually full of water. There was hardly any airspace at all at the top. And I didn't think really we'd have stand a chance in pumping that out. But eventually we got the pump to work, we made a makeshift dam out of polythene, and we started pumping the handle. So as we were pumping the handle, we could see that eventually the water level was beginning to go down. Not very much, but it was beginning to go down. And then we got to the actual limit at which we could pump any more water into the dam, because I mean, it, we, we'd packed it up with mud, we'd extended the polythene as much as we could, and there was always a danger that the water would um, sort of flow through. And Pete decided that he ought to go in and have a look. So, in you went into the passage, and if I say the airspace was minimal, it was pretty minimal. And I think his um, diving and swimming experience must have helped him quite a bit on that. Because there's really nose and mouth in the top of the passage to work your way along to get to the end of this section as to where they were working. Which he did. He grovelled around. He poured a few stones. And eventually, after a period of time, the water level did go down a bit. So I gave him a bit more working space, so he then poured out more stones, able to clear the thing a lot better. And then eventually, the water flooded away completely. So we're able to let the dam go, and the passage was totally clear, and we could carry on with the work. But the next thing was to get this pump out. Now, I think the MPC actually took this pump in and assembled it in position, and Pete didn't really know whether he could get it out. So what we did, we dismantled as much as we could and had to go along the cave entrance several times with each particular part, the delivery hose, the handle and everything else. And then we came to the act of trying to get the large pump out itself. Struggled across back to the car, which was only a mini at that time. No room for the pump in the car, put it in the boot and we thought, well, we'd better get rid of this and put, take it to the Bradford Pothole Club Hostel, which we called the dump at that time. So we drove around to the dump, stored the pump ready for the weekend's occasion for Peter. By this time we were starving, really hungry, and Peter got a little bit of food in his locker. And as is his want, and as we did, he looked around all the other lockers to try and scrounge his extra little bit of food that he could. But then we found one locker which was fairly flimsy, locked up with a Haspen staple, but we could just pull the door to one side and see it was full and it was wanted some of that food. So then they decided that the only way we could get in there without giving the game away was to pull up the hinge from the hinge side of the door open the door from the hinge side so the lock was still on, which we did. We got the necessary food out, we put the door back, we replaced the hinge back, piece back into its position, and no one knew actually that we'd actually broken in. The following week, Pete took his pump 
to the MPC's dinner. And after the proceedings, presented the pump and in Peter's way, delivered the speech and took the mick like he did. Later on in the Bradford Hostel, the, we were cooking in the kitchen and the lad or one of the members came in complaining about some of the food that was missing out of his locker. But he didn't know actually how they got him to do it. He didn't know how they'd actually got him, but he knew there was some food missing. And I just looked at Pete, and Pete just looked at me, and he just gave me one of his big, wide, four-faced grins. We are now up against time. So many people wanted to speak today. To do justice to Peter um, would have been very, very difficult in less time. To those who couldn't uh, get, get to speak, there's one or two people who are here who, who uh, we haven't been able to call. I do apologise, um, but now time is really pressing and we have to finish. And I think we've all heard of a remarkable person, a remarkable life, a wonderful life. The greatest pity was that Pete never got chance to write his autobiography. I'm certain Ken Wilson could have made a world bestseller out of it if he had. Because I have here a piece which he wrote large, which is wonderful writing, and I wanted to read it to you, but there isn't time. I'm going to finish with a unique illustration of Pete's mind, of how he thought about things. And I'm going to read to you a letter that he wrote last year. And there was a, a story going round. This is a letter that he wrote to his niece. And there was a story going round about a rainy afternoon on which Pete emptied a packed Cornish cafe by removing from his mouth a number of live slugs. On hearing the tale, Alec's daughter, Alison, then only 11, but apparently endowed with the livesey scepticism, wrote to Pete to check on the validity of the tale and to express her concerns about his apparent disregard for the welfare of small creatures. <laughs> he wrote back as follows. My dear niece Alison, I am sorry to say that much of what you have heard about your great uncle Pete is untrue. It is true that there were indeed ordinary people in my presence in that clotted Cornish cafe. But beyond that not insignificant fact, your informant has led you astray. Do not despair. This often happens to children. This is what actually happened. I had nothing at all to do with slugs. Ugh. I was merely offering sheltered accommodation to homeless snails. Just a small part of the charitable work in which I'm engaged in. <laughs> I do believe that others in our party were de determined to undermine my humble charitable, charitable act by turning it into a competition to see who could house the most homeless snails. I cannot say who encouraged this ridiculous competition, <laughs> but he is married to a certain Mrs. Cobley. As you will appreciate, I am not a competitive person. <laughs> but I did, through chance, win the snail housing competition by housing sn seven snails at once. The other scores were Mrs. Cobley none, Mr. Cobley, none. Mr. Lovey, none. And Mrs. Lovey, none. Mr. Lovey, by the way, Steve Foster. I would hasten to assure you that full consideration was given to an equal opportunities, multicultural approach <laughs> to this housing scheme. 
Four of the snails were black. <laughs> Three were a sort of fawn colour. All the snails were male. All the snails were female. I hope this curtails any further worries you may have. Your great uncle, Peter. And I think that letter says it all. A unique man with a unique sense of humour, a unique approach to life, and we are all most grateful to have known you, Pete.